Well, thanks a lot for the opportunity to present this. I'm sure this is a patient we've all seen. It's a patient that's gotten preoperative chemo radiation and comes in. There's no evidence of cancer. And in other words, they're a clinical complete response. Now, we all know that uh, 25 to 30 percent of patients will have a pathologic complete response after preoperative chemo radiation. Um, so how do we pick those patients out? Is it possible to do that? And is it possible, therefore, to avoid esophagectomy in this group of patients? Well, the problem is that it's very difficult to separate microscopic residual cancer from macroscopic residual cancer. So this is a patient that had a distal esophageal adenocarcinoma, got preoperative chemo radiation, and then an endoscopy was performed four weeks after. And what you see is an ulcer, no clear mass lesions, and mucosal biopsies end up being negative, but at the time of resection, there's residual cancer. And in fact, mucosal biopsies are very poor. The sensitivities, whether it's adeno or squamous, is about 35%. Um, and this is in part due to the fact, this is 100 patients with stage three disease that we gave preoperative chemo radiation to, and the biopsies were, 65% of them were negative, but all of them had cancer. And this is in part because not only um, is there not always disease in the mucosa, even though there can be disease in other portions of the wall, but also a large number of these patients have what's a microscopic residual disease. Only 12% of this group had greater than 50% positive. So even if it's present in the mucosa, let's say, with only 1 to 10% viable cancer cells, it may be difficult to identify without a target lesion the, that bit of cancer. EUS is also a very poor diagnostic tool. Uh, false positive is very high. It has a very difficult time distinguishing between fibrosis and cancer, and the specificity is on the order of 10%. CT scans are even worse. Uh, this is a study by David Jones um, in which 21 patients with a pathologic complete response were looked at with CT criteria of less than 5 millimeters wall thickness, and only three of the patients were able to be identified for a sensitivity of 14 percent. Well, what about PET scan? We know PET scan is very sensitive at identifying metastatic disease. Could it help us to pick out those patients that perhaps had a pathologic complete response? And this was uh, the question we asked in our group. We took patients with local regionally advanced esophageal cancer. We uh, evaluated them up front with PET, endoscopy, and a CT scan. They then received uh, concurrent chemo radiation, and four weeks later got the same um, series of PETs, endoscopies, and CTs, and then all underwent resection. Um, and what you find is, is that the post-PET is good at distinguishing macroscopic residual cancer, but really cannot distinguish less than that. Even if you have 10% viability in the specimen, it's hard to uh, separate that from pathologic complete response. So here's a patient post-chemo radiation, SUV is 7.5, they have macroscopic residual cancer. But it's much more difficult to distinguish between these two. These patients got preoperative chemo radiation. One has an SUV of 1.7, which is a path CR. The other one is an SUV of 2.3, and they have microscopic residual disease. Well, what about a nomogram? Can we throw together all these diagnostic studies? Can we add some clinical factors? Um, and come up with a score that can increase the probability of a path CR? And we tried to do this. Uh, the problem with this is that even if you got a PATH uh, CR nomogram score of 160, which was really hard to do, you had to have a PET with an SUV of zero and a variety of other things, the PATH CR rate was really only 60%. Well, um, can one go ahead and just simply observe those patients and then just selectively pick out the ones that recur local regionally? And this was kind of the idea behind RTOG0246. Could we use surgery on those patients who clearly had not responded? Um, and can we just selectively watch those where that clinical complete responders? And so in this study, uh, which included both adeno and squamous, 
patient's got an aggressive induction regimen of chemo followed by chemo radiation. And then upon completion, we're evaluated by a group, multidisciplinary group, and the onus was that if there was any suspicion of cancer at the reevaluation, they needed to undergo uh, surgery. If they were felt to be a clinical complete response, they were followed very carefully with surveillance. Every three months, they got endoscopy, CT imaging uh, for two times, and then six months by three, and then yearly. If they developed recurrent disease that was local, regional, they underwent a salvage esophagectomy. So here's the consort diagram. There were 41 patients that went into this single arm study. Induction treatment mortality was actually pretty high in this group. It was about 8%, and that might have been partially due to the fact that a lot of the treating centers were in the community in RTOG, and this may have been a little bit of an aggressive regimen. Nevertheless, um, 36 patients got to uh, the point to be evaluated in a multidisciplinary fashion. And of those patients, 21 or 58 percent were felt to have residual cancer. Um, now this is interesting because not all these patients at this time were getting PET scans because PET scans weren't available everywhere. So PET was encouraged, but it was only a minority that actually had, had PET. So this was basically based on endoscopy, clinical intuition, um, and CT scan. And 17 of those patients went on to get uh, a surgery. Uh, three had METs at the time, and one was medically inoperable. What is interesting, um, the clinical intuition was really good. All 17 of those patients had residual uh, cancer in their specimen, even without you know, better diagnostic studies. Um, the group that had a clinical complete response, there were 15 of them, and they were uh, watched. One patient who was in a clinical complete response insisted on having surgery, and he was taken to surgery and actually did have a path CR. Um, the other 14 were watched, and over the next uh, few years, three of them were uh, resected, uh, with a salvage resection, two of those three were long-term survivors. Uh, ultimately, the other uh, 11 were followed. Four of them are long-term survivors uh, without surgery, two adenos and two squames. And there's seven that are dead, and this is with an eight-year uh, follow-up. Now, are those patients who died, uh, most of those did die of metastatic disease, are those patients that could have been saved if we had done an elective uh, esophagectomy right four weeks after, uh, and I'm not sure about that. So anyway, here's the long-term outcome. The overall group uh, of, was a 37% five-year survival, and that was with eight years of follow-up. The clinical CR group, the 15 patients that we looked at and we tried to do selective surgery only if they recurred, had a five-year survival of 53%. Those patients who were felt to have residual cancer, the clinical non-CRs, and that then underwent surgery had a 41% uh, five-year survival. The median survivals for the clinical CRs were way greater, uh, 66 months versus 15 versus 36 months. So how does it stack up uh, with other multimodality trials? And here the cross trial has really set the bar pretty high. If you look at the five-year overall survival of the cross trial, it's 48%. Uh, our study, the selective study, had a five-year overall survival of 37%, which is comparable to the CalGB trimodality approach, and is certainly way better than RTOG's initial uh, definitive chemoradiation study uh, that didn't include uh, selective esophagectomy. So how do we approach it? Um, again, at Anderson, because the CROSS trial has set the bar so high, um, we tend to favor, if the patient is low risk for surgery, just doing a planned esophagectomy four weeks after chemoradiation. We do, however, have a, big, uh, a serious discussion with the patient, and if the patient is low risk and strongly does not want to uh, do surgery, we're willing to follow them. Uh, but we insist on very careful surveillance at our institution uh, if they choose that approach. The high risk patients, um, or the patients that have a tumor in the upper esophagus, if they're a clinical complete response, we'll watch them. 
and then uh, selectively operate on them if they recur local regionally. So what about squamous cell cancer versus adenos? Should we change our approach for that? Um, should a clinical complete response of squamous, should we watch those patients? And of course the reason for this question is the CROSS trial. Uh, this brought forth the fact that the squamous cell cancers appear to have a markedly higher past CR rate of 47% versus adenos of 23%. And I'll tell you, in Europe right now, they differentiate on these ClinCR patients if they're going to operate or not by histology. So I recently went to uh, MD Anderson in Madrid, and they have a strategy in which if the PET goes negative and it's a squam, um, they will uh, not operate, whereas if it's an adeno, they will because they think the past CR rate's uh, so much lower. So here's their strategy. Ours is based on risk. Theirs is based on histology a little bit. If they have an adeno patient, goes, uh, gets chemo radiation, and then has a clinical complete response, so they'll go ahead and do an esophagectomy. The squamous cells, though, if they have a clinical complete response, they'll watch them and only do a salvage um, if indeed they develop local regional recurrence. Now, I actually have some problems with this. I have no problems watching an adenocarcinoma and then selectively operating on it. You can always get good radial margins. You can take up a conduit to an area of the esophagus that hasn't been radiated. Uh, we've demonstrated that there's, um, using omentum and a variety of other things, a salvage adenocarcinoma does equally well versus a plan. So I don't have a problem watching adenos. I have some problems watching squamous, though, and that's mostly because of the location. They're in the middle, upper esophagus, that sits in a very tight area immediately behind the trachea, membranous portion of the trachea, and also right next to the aorta. So you have very little room for radial margin. Additionally, when you go and do a salvage, you're often having to plug into a radiated bit of esophagus, and the morbidity uh, tends to be much uh, higher. So I have actually, I would prefer, if they're a good performance, to operate on these squames, even if they go clean CR, because I've had bad experiences watching and then trying to salvage them. So here's a patient, 52-year-old female, developed dysphagia, and was found to have a middle squame. The EGD showed T3N1, 25 to 33 centimeters, CT PET, no distant metastases, bronchoscopy, no tracheal mucosa. Patient was treated with oxaloplatin, 5-fluorouracil, RT concurrently to 50.4 gray. And then uh, four weeks following this, uh, EGD showed no viable tumor, um, an ulcer, biopsy negative, the CT PET was a complete response, and the patient um, refused surgery. So 16 months later, they came back with dysphagia, and this is what they had. On their PET, they had an increased FTG avidity, SUV of 17, um, and on the bronch, you could see a necrotic ulcer in the right bronco intermedius that had fragments of squamous cell cancer, and then, of course, you can see this necrotic tumor uh, in the esophagus. And then, of course, I, I think it's much higher to, or the morbidity is much higher to do salvage and squames versus adeno. Here we've shown, uh, this is published by Dr. Sepeshi, member of our group, that in the modern era, really, salvage esophagectomy has similar uh, morbidity and mortality. Um, to planned esophagectomy, but that is because the vast majority of these patients are adeno, and we can pull these things up, we can wrap them with omentum, we can plug them into a non-radiated portion of esophagus. In very difficult cases, we could even use jejunum or whatever, but, but there's really no difference in the modern era with salvage. But if you subset and look at these squamous cells, these ones are at higher risk with salvage. And this is uh, concerning. The pneumonia rate um, is, uh, is higher. It's actually flipped there. The esophageal leak rate's not 53%. That's actually the pneumonia rate, but in the salvage, which is still high. Reoperation rate is higher. And really of concern is this 30-day mortality, whereas if you do a planned um, esophagectomy and a squame, uh, 
their mortality is very acceptable at 2.1%, um, but if you do a salvage, it's 9.3%. Uh, so where are our future directions in this? Uh, and you know, functional MRI has a lot of promise. Uh, this looks at the diffusion coefficient of water, and in uh, patients who have been treated with preoperative chemoradiation, if they have a lot of viable cancer, the intracellular junctions prevent the diffusion of water, whereas if the, if the tumor is dead, there's much more diffusion. And in a pilot study uh, that we did at Anderson, the sensitivity of this to pick out path CR was 100%, with a specificity of 75%. So this is a really encouraging modality. It's currently being uh, tested in NRG in a prospective fashion. Well, what about biomarkers? Uh, and here we've, we've looked at hedgehog Li1. This seems to be associated uh, with radiation resistance. Uh, but the problem is with these biomarkers is they're not granular enough for the individual patient. And also you tend to need uh, tissue before treatment because after treatment many times you can't get a, a, a biopsy. Um, and so at a granular level, it's not enough to make the, a, a prediction. You know, perhaps in the future, um, with circulating markers, uh, you know, combining these with clinical and diagnostic studies will be uh, better able. But at, at the present, uh, there really are no biomarkers to pick it out. So in summary then, PATH-CR occurs in a subset of patients after preoperative chemoration. Uh, the rates are higher in squamous cell than ADNO. Um, PET, endoscopic biopsy, CT scan after pre-op CRT uh, really has very low sensitivity for past CR. So our strategy at Anderson really is if the patient has a clinical complete response and they're low risk, we favor a planned esophagectomy regardless of histology uh, four weeks after. We do definitely have the discussion with the patient though so they understand the data. They understand the data that a low, um, that if they're low risk and uh, that our TOG study was a 37% five year with that approach versus 48 for cross. Um, and if the patient strongly does not want uh, surgery, we'll watch them, but make sure that the surveillance is very careful. The high risk patients, upper esophageal, if they get a clinical uh, CR, uh, we'll watch them and then you know, of course, unfortunately, when they locally recur, you have to, you know, have that discussion and proceed with a, you know, a higher risk operation. Uh, thanks a lot.